today as we come to the table. The only thing worse than a church that is in chaos is a large church in chaos because it affects more people. And it affects not only the people in that church, but the people in that community. And it affects the view of the church to the world, which oftentimes can be very detrimental to the gospel. You see, while God is a God of the Spirit, He is also a God of order. And neither the Spirit nor God's church functions properly without each other, without that order, if you will. God uses order by His Spirit, and He wants His church to operate in that order so it can function properly. Have you ever tried to let a toddler drive a car? Without the proper training to learn the complexities of driving, a dangerous accident is almost guaranteed to occur. Well, a church of any size without wise, godly leadership in place is similarly headed for disaster. People will undoubtedly be hurt in the crash. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. Pastor Mark reminds you today that good leadership is vital for the local church body. Your leaders need to be committed to the Word, have wise counsel in their lives, and trust God with everything they have, especially the churches they lead. Anyone who doesn't meet those criteria is unfit to lead God's people. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Titus, chapter 1, with today's edition of Come to the Table. Let's open our Bibles to Titus chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 9 and today focusing in on the requirements of elders. We're not going to quite get as far as I wanted to, but that's okay. Uh, we can take up right where we leave off today, but I want to read through this, the section we're going to cover, or at least most of what we're going to cover, and then uh, we'll go back and begin to look at it more closely. But the book of Titus chapter 1 verse 5, Paul says this, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the meat of your word. And that's what we're getting into today, Lord, the meat of your word. And I pray now that as we get into it, Lord, that you would not only instruct us as a church, on what the proper order for church leadership is, but you would instruct us in our homes as husbands and wives, as moms and dads, on what the proper order for our home is, even as children in that home. And Lord, I thank you that you are a God of order. I thank you that you give us order and that you've set the universe up in an orderly fashion. And Lord, thank you that you've given us your word so that we can know what that fashion and what that order is. And I pray now, God, that as we get into your word, that again, you would open your word to us, again, more than just head knowledge. I pray you would open your word to us where it's heart knowledge and where we understand it, Lord. We see your wisdom, and Lord, we will willingly and obediently follow your direction so that we might, Lord, please you with your church, for indeed, this is your church. It's not ours. We are simply stewards. And so, Lord, instruct us as you being the head of your church, how your church is to operate. And we thank you, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we look today at requirements for elders. 
Uh, again, verses 5 through 9, we're only going to make it through 7 today, but that's okay because this is one of those things where we get into a lot of doctrine. You know, we talk about the meat of the Word, and that is the Bible's broken up in different things. You, as we've said before, you have your vegetables, you have, you know, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and the things that maybe aren't quite as fun to eat, but they're healthy and you need to do it. And then we have the times we do, like we did a couple of weeks ago with the uh, prophecy update. That's like the chocolate sundae of the Bible, and we put the whipped cream on top, and we all leave excited looking for the return of the Lord and ready to go. This is now the meat, the main course, so to speak, as we get into doctrine. And that is how God's church is to run the requirements of elders. And so we're going to, again, get some good protein, spiritual protein, as we get into today, as we look at church leadership. And being a leader in God's church is no small responsibility and should never be taken lightly. And that's why Paul today lays out very clearly and very detailed the requirements needed in order to fill this role. And we'll see that these men not only need to be very mature, but they need to be very responsible. Now, as we noted, the theme of the letter to Titus is setting things in order. Uh, as Paul mentioned there in verse 5, that's the theme for the entire book of Titus. And that is what God will very clearly show the church today, us today in church leadership, God has a very specific order and outline as to how his church is to be run, and hence he's very specific about church leadership. You know, God takes great private ownership in the church because, as I said in the prayer, it is not our church, it is his. Now, I understand when someone says, hey, is this your church? I know what they mean, and I don't take offense to that. They're simply saying, are you the pastor here? I get that. But in a technical sense, we need to understand this church belongs to the Lord. It is his church. And because of that, he takes great care in watching over it. And he cares greatly as to how it is run. He cares how I watch over you as your pastor. He cares how the leadership watches over the church as leadership. And so he gets very, very intimately involved. And he's given very, very intimate details, which means really we have no excuse not to know how his church is supposed to run. And so while Paul is instructing Titus on how to set things in order in this area, he's also going to give very clear direction in how to do it. You see, it's one thing to know you're doing something that needs to be straightened out, or you may be even doing it wrong, but if no one tells you how to do it after that, it's very frustrating. Okay, I know this isn't working right, but what do I do now? So he's going to be showing Titus, here's what you need to fix if it's not working right, and here's how you need to set the churches up to make sure they are working right. Now, why would Paul need to do that? Again, uh, Paul would do that because when Paul planted churches, he oftentimes would plant the church and move on to the next town. Plant a church, move on to the next town, and he wouldn't establish leadership in that church. And you might say, why in the world wouldn't Paul establish leadership? Wasn't that negligence of duty? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, that was intentional by Paul because Paul wanted the pastors to begin teaching the word of God and for as the people came in, for God to show who the leaders were. You see, leaders aren't chosen by people. They're supposed to be chosen by God. And it takes a while for someone to prove themselves. Are they called? Are they going to be faithful? And so you don't want to just throw leadership into leadership right away. You want to give them time to prove that they're the right leadership that God has called. And so Paul now, in writing this letter to Titus, that's what he's doing. There were churches all over Crete. Remember we said Crete was a city of hundreds of, of uh, rather an island of hundreds of cities. And so all of these churches are spreading, and Paul says, that's great. I'm glad there's pastors now leading them. Now let's go and appoint leadership to stand with the pastors, elders to come alongside them. By now, they've had time to be proven. They know who's going to be faithful, and they can begin to put them in place. And so what I love about this letter and what I love about the way God writes his word, especially being in church leadership and wanting to know what God wants me to do with his church because I'm accountable to him for that. I like the fact that God is not only correctional, but he's also directional. And that's what he's going to do with Titus today. He's going to speak about being correctional as well as directional. And why would you need the correctional? Again, remember, as Paul waited for a while for the leaders to be exposed and to show who truly was leading, you would have lots of people coming in trying to lead that didn't really belong there. And because of that, you would have problems in the church, and Paul knew they needed to be corrected and fixed, as well as a clear direction for moving forward. And so we're going to see him do that with Titus in this letter. It's one thing to be corrected, but again, you want to make sure you're going the right direction afterwards. 
In November of 1975, 75 convicts started digging a secret tunnel designated to bring them up on the other side of the wall of the Saltillo prison in northern Mexico where they believed they could escape. However, on April 18, 1976, guided by pure genius, tongue-in-cheek, they found that they in reality had tunneled up right in the center of the nearby courtroom where they were meeting and where they were sentenced in the first place. So as the lid was lifted, they found all 75, rearrested them, and promptly put them back in prison. And again, the idea here is that they wanted to get the correction, the right direction, but they didn't go the right direction. They went the wrong direction, and they didn't accept correction either way. So we want to make sure that as God gives us correction, that we know that we're going in the right direction. And so let's take up here in verse 5 where Paul begins to, after laying the groundwork in the first few verses, but now he goes on specifically for the qualifications of church leadership. And notice what he says. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order, there's the theme of the book right there, the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So Paul now declares the purpose he left Titus in Crete, and that purpose is, again, as we noted uh, for the entire letter, that things would be set in order of the things that were lacking and appointing elders in every city. Now, to set in order, these were words, interestingly, that were used by medical writers of that day of setting broken limbs or straightening crooked ones. And that's why I say probably Paul was not just laying out the leadership structure or the way that the leaders are supposed to be in their requirements, but Paul at the same time was saying, you need to go reset some limbs. You need to fix some things that are broken. Again, Crete was known as a, a very wicked island in many ways. The people of Crete had a bad reputation, if you remember that. So imagine starting a church and leaving it there a while without leadership. You can imagine what would happen without clear leadership. And so, again, very possibly the church out of order in some places here that needed to be set in order. And it's the language used there of resetting things and getting them back in place. Either way, Paul recognized that without this order, the church of Crete would be ineffective. And note this, excitement and numbers are encouraging. But without proper order, it can be very destructive because larger numbers are affected. The only thing worse than a church that is in chaos is a large church in chaos. Because it affects more people. And it affects not only the people in that church, but the people in that community. And it affects the view of the church to the world, which oftentimes can be very detrimental to the gospel. You see, while God is a God of the Spirit, He is also a God of order. And neither the Spirit nor God's church functions properly without each other, without that order, if you will. God uses order by His Spirit, and He wants His church to operate in that order so it can function properly. While addressing the gifts of the Spirit in Corinth, Paul tells them in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, notice what he said, let all things be done decently and in order. And notice there are two parts to this verse. Now, Paul specifically here was addressing the work of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, which the Corinthians were using but abusing. They were not using them properly. And because of that, the church was chaotic and it was being a bad testimony to the, to the uh, people in that uh, particular community. So Paul gives two parts to this verse. Notice part number one, let all things be done and what we're focusing on today decently and in order. And the key is, is both of these need to be in place if the church is going to function properly. That is, a lot of people focus on, um, you know, just uh, you know, let all things be done. And so they open up the move of the Spirit, and there's no guidelines scripturally, and everything gets chaotic and crazy. But they say, you know what, we're following the Spirit. And again, I'm glad they're allowing the Spirit to operate. But again, the verse doesn't stop on let all things be done. The last part of the verse gives the way it's to be used, and that is decently and in order. So allow these things to happen, but make sure they're within the biblical guidelines. And again, you can have mistakes on both ends. You have those that let all things be done and they ignore the order and it's chaotic. And then you have those that simply keep the church decently and in order, but never allow the move of the Holy Spirit. And so you have a church that is doctrinally accurate, but is dead spiritually. So you need the balance of both. They have to come together. Everything be done, but done decently and in order. And so, again, it, it prevents confusion and chaos, 
And quite frankly, that's exactly what we see in many churches today who neglect the proper order in God's church. You know, order is necessary, and it's a necessary foundation for everything in the universe. God has set our universe up as a place of order, the way that everything rotates, the way that everything's placed. Can you imagine if it was just chaotic in the universe and whatever planet went around, whatever, no gravity, no, you'd never know what's going to slam into you at any moment. And so God has set everything up from the very universe all the way down to the most minute detail here on the earth uh, in an in a orderly fashion. And it's the only way that things go well. And if we go outside of those boundaries and guidelines, we can't expect that it's going to go well. Because it's not going to go well. It only goes well when we follow the, God's guidelines and in the proper boundaries and the proper order. And one of those things, proper order, proper boundaries, that Paul addresses here is one of the first things he says to Titus here, appoint elders in every city. Note that, appoint them, not vote for them. Now, depending on your church background, that might seem a little bit strange and maybe may possibly even offensive in some cases if that's how you grew up. And I'm not attacking churches that do that. I'm simply saying that the Bible, nowhere in Scripture does the Bible say that the church is to vote for leadership. Voting is not a biblical concept. Appointing is a biblical concept. So, Mark, where does voting come in the church of America? Because we're a democratic society. We vote for everything. So what we've done is we've brought the way we do our democracy into the doors of the church. And in some instances, it works great. And in some instances, it doesn't work so good at all. And that's why the Lord gives his direction here. Make sure that you don't, he doesn't say don't vote, but he says, make sure that you appoint. Now, you might be saying, well, wait a minute. What about in the book of Acts where all the deacons were appointed, they were voted or they were voted on, so to speak. Very different category. Elders and bishops and or church leadership, the word that Paul is using here today and the words that Paul is using are very different from the words that are used in Acts chapter 6, diokonia. We'll see episkopos here, which is church leadership. We'll see diokonia or where we get deacons in Acts chapter 6. And all that a deacon is biblically is a servant. If you're sweeping a floor, you're a deacon. If you're cleaning a bathroom, you're a deacon. It is a servant position. If you're an episcopos, you're in church leadership, and you have the responsibility to lead in that church leadership. And so elders and leaders in Scripture are simply recognized for their call due to the evidence in their lives. Then they are appointed by the current church leadership like Paul is telling Titus to do here in Crete. And you see why God would do it this way. Again, here's why God would do it that way. It not only requires people to see the evidence of the call, but it also keeps out politics, popularity, and whoever has the most money from running the church. Okay, so these have been plagues of the church since its inception. Someone being in a position because of politics, or someone being in a position because they're popular, or really probably the more prominent one in our day and age, someone being appointed as an elder because they have lots of money. And the pastor realizes, if I get them in there and they're on my side, maybe we can do that extension. Maybe we can do this. And again, I don't want to project on some everyone's, past, uh, everyone's heart what's going on. I'm saying the temptation can be there to do that. God says, I don't even want that temptation. I don't want it to be about your decisions and politics and popularity and who's got the money and who doesn't. He says, I want to show you by the Holy Spirit who is the one that's to be the leader, and then you appoint them. And that's why at Calvary, what we do is, is we watch and we find out which of you guys are elding. Which of you are deaconing? Which of you are deaconessing, so to speak? And then from that, you're appointed to leadership because it's recognized by the leadership. And that way it keeps man's flesh out of it and it's a work of the spirit. Now, again, because of this, you know, we just come alongside and agree with God. God shows who it is. We agree with God and they're now in leadership. And this is, again, the first instruction that Paul gives to Titus. Make sure it's led by the Spirit and it's not something that you simply do based on whatever the culture of the day is doing. Follow my biblical instruction. And that's why we have to be, always stay true to the Scripture, especially when it comes to issues as important as church leadership, because these are those that are watching over God's prized possession, you and his church. So he says, make sure you appoint them in every city. And now he begins in the qualifications of who a leader is to be. He says, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, 
having faithful children not accused of dissipation or subordination. Now, we're only going to go a verse at a time. I know it would flow better if I kept reading, but we're going to break this up in, in little bites here. Notice the first requirement is, he said, if a man is blameless. So the first requirement that Paul gives here of an elder or a pastor in the church is that he has to be a man. Now, I realize in today's culture, this can be contentious because of the, the world we live in today, although it shouldn't be contentious, and it certainly shouldn't be within the church. And the contention comes in because some try to make this a gender issue, but it has nothing to do with gender. This is not about gender at all. The issue here is not whether one gender is better than the other or which gender should be there. It is simply and only based on God's creation, God's order, and God's authority structure for the church. Remember this. Jesus Christ was God in human form. Even he came under authority while he walked the earth. Why? Because that was the proper authority structure. When Jesus became a man, he wasn't to walk as the father. He was to walk under that authority as a man. And even as Jesus came under authority, God has set an authority structure for his church here on earth. Now, it really goes back to Genesis and the beginning of creation. But for time's sake, we'll let Paul explain it from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Now, if you want to turn there, you can. Paul here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, he was addressing the roles of men and women and those who should be teaching the congregation. And note that this is congregationally as the leader of the church. That's the context. And Paul said this, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And we'll explain that in a moment. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Notice God's order. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, let me first note that when Paul says a woman is to be in silence, he's not saying that a woman can't teach or that a woman can't speak or that a woman shouldn't speak even in church because we see throughout history that was never forbidden as well as, um, as a matter of fact, God also knows that it's impossible to have a woman not speak. So that would never be something God, I couldn't help that. That was, listen, I have the right I've got a bunch of them at home, but beyond that, beyond that, I talk as much as any of you ladies in this room. So I uniquely as a man, I'm not the grunter. You know, I'm not the guy with the pole, you know, the big caveman stick, uh, uh, you know, I'm like talking just as much as all of you. So I feel like I have a right to say that. But anyway, it's not about one being better than the other or, or putting, and we'll give the, I want to give the biblical uh, boundaries for men and women here so that we understand it, that it's not a gender issue. As a matter of fact, it, it doesn't say that women can't be used in Scripture and can't even be teaching within the church in proper context. We see in the Bible there are female prophets that got anointed and spoke through in the Scripture. We see there are to be teachers of other women in the Scripture, and we even see that they were used as evangelists, at least one particular one we see with Jesus, where he's with the woman at the well, and she goes into the city and preaches the gospel to the men, by the way. They come out to her, and they receive Christ. So what we see is God is not saying that a woman can't be a teacher. God is not even saying that a woman can't be an evangelist. God is not even saying that a woman can't have a gift of prophecy that could be used in the local church. What God is saying, because of basic order of creation and a consequence of the garden, which we'll bear out here a little bit more in just a moment, this, this is my proper order. A woman is not to be a teacher or a pastor over the body of Christ. And again, evangelism is different because sharing Jesus is how people are saved and God will use anyone to do that and wants to use all of us and has even given a mandate for all of us to do that. The Bible's only limitation here in reverence to women is being a Bible teacher or pastor for the church body. You've been listening to Come to the Table with Pastor Mark Kirk. Pastor Mark has been teaching through the book of Titus. This book clearly lays out the fact that God's incarnation is what makes the gospel so powerful. Jesus came to earth in human form, took on flesh, died for humanity's sins, and rose from the dead. That's remarkable. This is the fundamental belief to stand on, and because of that, you should want to live pure and upright in a way that honors God. No other religion can claim the very words that you just heard. No other so-called God can claim the power and authority that our God accomplished. If you're just beginning to learn what it means to follow Jesus, or if you have any questions about what you've heard today, we'd love to speak with you. You can call us at 
865-609-1385. Again, that phone number is 865-609-1385. You can also visit our website, thewaymedia.net, and search for our questions and comments link to connect with us. Want to hear this message again? You can easily download the Way Media app. Come to the Table is a ministry of Calvary Knoxville, and we hope you've been blessed by this time today in the book of Titus. If you're ever in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, would you come join us on a Sunday morning? Thewaymedia.net has the information you need to know about service times and location. We look forward to meeting you. Please join us again next time as Pastor Mark has more to share from the book of Titus here on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary, Knoxville.